My name is Neil Shubin from the University of Chicago, and we're going to talk today about organogenesis in deep time. In particular, we're going to look at this. We're going to try to compare a fish to a human. How do you compare a fish fin to a human limb? How did the limb come about from fins? And what are the different ways we pull together different types of data? Well, let's think of it this way. This is a nice starting point. Think about comparing, like I say, a human arm to a, to a fin of a fish shown on the, on the left here. They look very different, right? If you look at the bones shown in black, there doesn't really seem to be a whole lot of correspondence. Fish have lots of bones. We have the one bone, two bone, little bone finger pattern seen in chickens and whales and everything with limbs. Uh, also, fish have fin rays, which, which we don't have. Big differences. Yet, we can bridge these gaps when we look at fossils. If we were to fill this diagram with some of the fossils, what you see here are you start to see lots of finned creatures, creatures with thin webbing, thin rays, but also having the one bone, two bone, little bone pattern as well. So what this means is if we want to bridge the gap between fins and limbs, what we need to do is to have expeditions targeted to key parts of the tree of life. That is, we can target certain time periods to find fossils. And some of those fossils will start to bridge the gap between fins uh, and limbs. But that's not the only thing that's important here. When we start to have these fossils, we can start to compare living creatures in different ways. That is, we can start to compare a human arm to the fin of a fish by seeing correspondences that would have been absent to us without the fossil evidence. What that enables us to do is design experiments. That is, we can design new experiments based on our paleontological understandings on the developmental genetics of all kinds of different kinds of fish, non-model organisms. And in fact, it works all ways. Once we have these experiments based on non-model organisms, we can begin to target new parts of the tree of life where we may be missing fossil data. So the central idea here is that fossils enable, enable us to bridge gaps uh, in, in the record, the anatomical record of the tree of life. That enables us to design experiments in developmental genetics on living creatures. And the more we understand about developmental genetics of living creatures, the more we understand about what gaps exist in the fossil record and where we need to lead the next expeditions. So really, the fossil and genetic data work hand in hand. So let's work through uh, an example here. Well, our work obviously begins with the origin of tetrapods, the transition, say, of something like a fish on top uh, to a limbed animal uh, on the bottom. And we can design expeditions that bridge this gap. And what we do is we look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, uh, and rocks that are exposed to the surface for us to find fossils. Using that toolkit, we can begin to bridge this gap. It turns out to understand the origin of tetrapods, we need to focus on environments like this. Nearshore marine environments like ancient seaways, but likewise ancient, ancient highlands. So delta systems turn out to be really perfect for us. Because when we have a system like this, we can sample ancient seas, ancient estuaries, ancient rivers and streams, you know, the whole enchilada, uh, as they say. So really, it became clear very early in our, in our study that the best places that had these kind of delta systems of the right age in the late Devonian period were centered in three general places in North America. This is a slide actually taken from an undergraduate college geology textbook, which launched, helped us launch a number of expeditions. But it became very clear to us that two of these areas, which were seen in this diagram, were known by scientists before. We had previously worked on the so-called Catskill Rocks of eastern Pennsylvania. Other colleagues had worked uh, in East Greenland. These are very well-studied rocks. Yet from this diagram, you can see what led us to the Arctic in the first place, is rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks exposed across the surface uh, in an area of, uh, of the Arctic that was completely unexplored by vertebrate paleontologists. So we had ideal geology, but really very few of our colleagues had worked on these rocks. So off we went. Anytime you talk about a fossil expedition, you're really talking about teamwork, and I just want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, my graduate mentor, Farris Jenkins, uh, he and I have these big smiles on our faces. The reason why is because something that's in this plaster jacket here. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Ted Deschler, shown in the upper left, he's been a, a partner in these expeditions for, for, for decades. Likewise, all the field crews that we've had uh, over several decades, as well as the lab team as well. This is a team effort discovering fossils. We don't go out there alone. We go out there in, in teams of very talented people. So we started these expeditions uh, in, in 1999 based on this kind of map. And what you see on this map are the islands of the Canadian Arctic, and surrounded in red are where the Devonian Age rocks are exposed. 
And the first set of them that we did, we had to get to by these helicopters and planes because it's pretty far away. This sort of, this sort of dictates the kind of science that we can do. Using this, spending several hours on, on a helicopter or a plane, we got to the western part of the Canadian Arctic, shown on the arrow here. This area was you know, ideal for exposures. What you see is a vista, a plain of Devonian Age rocks uh, all across uh, this landscape here. But this was the wrong fossil environment to hold the kinds of creatures we were interested in. This was an ancient marine system. This was a system that had ancient deep water sediments. So we weren't finding the kind of critters we were on the hunt for, which is, say, a flat-headed fish uh, with fins. So we had to retool a little bit. So we used the geological uh, understandings here. This is an ancient delta system. We were in the ancient seaway. We needed to move upstream. To move upstream in the ancient geological rocks meant moving east. So we went east in the next year. You can see here in 2000 where the arrow is. We went to southern Ellesmere Island. This is what it looked like. It's a really marvelous place, montane with you know, with red rocks. This contained ancient rivers and streams that held a number of lobe-finned uh, fish uh, critters. We homed in on a particular valley that had a layer of fossils, uh, fossil fish, that were preserved one on top of the other. These fish were very well preserved, and it really wasn't until 2004 that one of my colleagues removed a, a rock from this layer. You can Steve Gates, who's a professor at Brown University on the left, removed a rock here, and he saw a V. And he called us over and he said, what's this, what's this bone here? You can barely see it in this diagram, in this, in this picture. But it's, it was beautiful because what it is is it's a snout of a fish. And not just any fish, it's a snout of a flat-headed fish. And one of the big transitions is going from a conical head to a flat-headed animal. Here I had a flat-headed fish looking right at me. So we bring these things home. It turns out we found uh, four of them this first year. They come home and the preparators begin to work on them, removing the rock grain by grain. And you can see what's emerging here is a flat head with eyes on top. Several months later, you can see this thing exposing even more. You can see the head revealing itself. You can even see the shoulder girdle here uh, uh, revealing itself. And maybe even this creature even has a neck. Remember what, what this quest is all about, sort of bridging this gap between lobe fin fish and limbed animal, maybe finding a flat-headed fish with fins. This is what the expedition led to, a flat-headed fish with fins. Like a fish, it has scales on its back and fins with fin webbing. Like a tetrapod, it has a flat head with eyes on top, a neck, and when we cracked open the fin, we found bones that correspond to upper arm, forearm, even parts of a wrist. Here's a CT scan of the fin, and you can see what it has is a humerus, then two bones here, a radius, an ulna, and shown in blue here are the fin rays. So it's a real mix of characteristics. Shown on the left, this is the work of Justin Lemberg, a graduate student in my laboratory, shows the joints of this animal. In A, you see the shoulder of this, of this animal, the socket on the shoulder on the left, and uh, the, the ball of the humerus on, on the right. This is a fish with an elbow. You can see the elbow in B. And there are even two parts of a wrist, a proximal carpus and a distal carpus. This is a fish with components of our own anatomy uh, inside. And we can use CT scanning, as you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the image here, we can begin to dissect the skull using CT scanning and begin to see the individual bones and how they suture together. It turns out that when we use living animals, this is an alligator gar shown on the bottom right here, and an alligator gar will bite animals in the water. But as it does so, the bones of the skull show cranial kinesis. They move in particular ways relative to one another. And when we analyze Tiktaalik's skull here, which is this fossil creature I'm, I'm showing you, we can begin to see that the joints of this animal's skull can actually move. It has cranial kinesis, much like a living alligator gar. So what I'm saying is when we find these fossils, the discovery is really only the beginning. Because then we can start to, to work on their anatomy, compare them to other creatures, and begin to assess their biomechanics, how they ate, how they walked. And, 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 and how they lived in these aquatic environments uh, in Devonian streams. So what we have with this creature, Tiktaalik rosea, is an animal that has lungs and gills. It has fins that have components of limbs inside. It has a neck. It really has a mix uh, of characteristics. And when we map this in the phylogenetic tree, what we see is it holds a relatively special place. That is, you can see the fish on the bottom and the limbed animals on top. Tiktaalik sits right here in the middle, it shows us the sequence of the acquisition of tetrapod characteristics, whether it's necks, fingers, wrists, toes, and so forth. Well, how is this relevant to developmental biology? 
Well, remember what we're saying is when we have fossils like Tiktaalik, we can compare the arms of, say, people and chickens and mice to the fins of fish in novel ways. What creatures like Tiktaalik are showing us is that fish, back in the Devonian, had wrists. They had components of the distal, the terminal ends of the appendage, such as seen as our own, our own limbs. So what that means is, if the fossil should be read at face value, is that sometime in the distant past, and maybe even in living fish, there should be the machinery by which limbs and toes and fingers and wrists and ankles are developed. So let's get back to this comparison here. If you look at a zebrafish, say the, 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 the fish on the, on the left and a human uh, here on the right, you know, those bones of the fins don't look, don't look very similar. Where the similarities start to emerge is when we compare them to the fossils, like I just showed you, but also when we compare their development. See, what we have here is a chicken limb in its development, taken from a textbook. And you can see the limb bud uh, shown on the left. It develops as a little bud that sticks out of the body. And as it develops, the cartilage skeleton begins to form. Now, what's driving the development of that cartilage skeleton are a set of interactions among signaling centers, like this region here, the AER, and another one seen on the bottom here, the ZPA, but as well as other factors, genes and proteins, that are turned on and off, driving the patterns of development and pattern formation that are so characteristic of limbs. Really, the comparison we want to make is not just between the structures of fins and limbs, but the developmental mechanisms by which the skeletal pattern of fins and limbs emerge. How similar are they and how different are they? So to do that, we focus on a variety of different signaling systems as well as transcription factors. One of the transcription factors that's been incredibly important to us are the Hox genes. The Hox genes have been shown to be important in a variety of processes of development, from hindbrains to the axial skeleton to limbs. To give you a, an example of why they're considered so important, here's a wild type a mouse limb. If you knock out some of the Hox genes of what are known as the 13 parallel groups, Hox D13 and Hox A13, you can develop a, a, mouse, fin, a mouse limb that has uh, no, no fingers, toes, uh, or, or wrists or ankle bones. And these are segment-specific modifications of the appendage. And if you knock out uh, elements of the 11 cognate groups, you're missing the middle segment of the appendage. So these are genes that are really involved with the specification of different components of our appendages. They take a very, very special role in, in our understanding of the origin of digits from fish fins. The question is, how has these patterns of expression, patterns of activity of these genes evolved? Are they present in fish? Are they doing similar things in fish? What's involved in their regulation and their activity? How is this assembled uh, going from fish to limbed animals? Well, there have been a number of studies of the expression uh, of these genes in diverse limbed animals. And, and interestingly, they follow two phases of expression. Look at the limb skeleton on the left. That has three components. It has a top component consisting of one bone, has a central um, segment composed of two bones, and has a distal segment composed of multiple bones. Turns out there are two phases in the expression of Hox genes that are involved with the specification of these components of the appendage. The earliest phase, shown on top here, shows the different genes of the Hox system um, expressed within one another. So these are like nested um, sets of expression of one set of genes in the domain of expression of another. Think of Russian dolls. This phase of expression acts early in limb development and is involved in the specification of the first two segments of the appendage. Coming on later is a late phase pattern of these same genes. This, is in, this involves expression across the entire distal domain of what will become the digits and wrist of, of the limb, and activity of the late phase is what's driving uh, specification of the distal component, that component which includes the wrist and finger bones of, of tetrapods. It's an open question. To what extent is the origin of the tetrapod limb based on the origin of a novel late phase pattern of Hox expression? How did this come about? Is this something we see in fish? Is this something that comes about with tetrapod? How is it assembled over evolutionary time? If you take creatures like Tiktaalik at their word, the fossils, it would suggest that perhaps late phase expression already existed in fish fins, and maybe it's doing something else. So let's look at that. So the question is really, when did late phase Hox expression come about? Did it come about, is it unique to tetrapods, or is it something that we see primitively uh, in fish? 
So one of my graduate students, Marcus Davis, started this quest to understand patterns of activity of Hox genes in limbs and fins. And he started by looking at paddlefish. And you can wonder, why paddlefish? Well, here's a paddlefish. Paddlefish, it turns out you can get a lot of embryos of these things. And they have big, fleshy fins. As you can see in, in blue here, these are the car this is the cartilage of the fin. It's big, fleshy cartilage. So these are really relatively easy to, to analyze. Furthermore, um, these, these, these critters uh, have a phylogenetic position that's very relevant. They're very basal ray fin fish. So they're sort of close to the branch point of creatures like Tiktaalik. So it gives us a window into that. So in looking at Hox expression, Marcus found looking at early expression, he found they have an early phase pattern of Hox expression. If you look later on, they have a late phase pattern of Hox expression. So it really does appear they have two phases of Hox expression, and that late phase Hox expression correlates to just like a distal strip of cells that you see in the distal terminus uh, of the appendage. The real question here is if we look at these two phases of Hox expression, if you look at a mouse, Early phase Hox expression is on one phase of the chromosome, on the, on the telomeric phase of the chromosome, and late phase expression, that expression that's, drive, that's driven in the, the wrists and, and, and digits and so forth, is on the centromeric side of the chromosome. So there's a real structural organization to the enhancers and regulatory uh, apparatus, the architecture, that drives these patterns of late and early phase activity. And this is well known for mouse from the work of Denis de Boulle's laboratory. So what we thought we'd ask is, how was this pattern of, of, of regulation generated? Is it present in fish, and what is it doing? And but the problem is, we don't know much about fish. So we really had to assemble those, those data. But here's the problem. If you look at late phase expression, the potential, and some of these enhancers that are present uh, in uh, in fish, you actually have some of the late phase enhancers, such as this one here, CSB. It turns out if you make a reporter of the fish element, say from Fugu, and put it in a mouse reporter, you don't get any activity in the limb. So the earliest analysis, analyses seem to suggest that late phase enhancers, regulatory apparatus, are present in, in, uh, in fish genomes, but they're not active in limbs, that they're not capable of driving late phase expression. This kind of analysis suggested that late phase uh, expression is unique to digits, unique to tetrapods. And, and that regulatory apparatus is there, but not functional in the same way. Well, it turns out if you look at this, it seems to be maybe we're, we were not relying on the right animals for comparison. So let's take this area here. Here is uh, a chromosome. You can see the Hox cluster on the left. And on the right, shown in green, are early phase enhancers. If you look at a vista plot of this enhancer, uh, comparing human through fish, through zebrafish and pufferfish, and you compare the similarities of these regions, what you'll see is you have curves on the top, the human and the chicken, which suggests they are very similar, that they have this early phase enhancer. But if you look at the zebrafish and the pufferfish, no lines whatsoever. There's no conservation at all. So this kind of conservation analysis would suggest that these enhancers aren't even present uh, in, in fish fins. Well, it turns out we might not be comparing the right animals. And the reason for this is that fish have a whole genome duplication. And there are three people from my lab who've been working on this particular problem. Andrew Gerke, who's a graduate student, our colleague and collaborator, Jose Luis Gomez Scarmetta, and Tetsuya Nakamura, a, uh, a postdoc in my laboratory. And they've been interested in this whole genome duplication as perhaps a reason for maybe why we're not seeing these enhancers in certain kinds of fish. Look at it this way. If you look at the Hox clusters, in humans there are four Hox clusters. You can see it in the middle here. If you look at basal creatures such as Amphioxus or jawless fish, what you'll see is there is a set of duplications that go from the single Hox cluster shown in Amphioxus to the four uh, clusters that are shown in humans. But if we look at living fish, the ones that have been the basis for the comparisons we've already talked about, you could see they've taken this duplication one step further. Zebrafish have eight of these clusters. In fact, even salmon have 16 of them. So how do you know what to compare? Maybe functions have been shuffled between them. So the idea of Andrew in the laboratory is maybe, what if we took a fish that didn't have this whole genome duplication, say a gar, and use that as the basis of comparison. Maybe having the right fish system would allow us to pick up these enhancers, which we're not seeing uh, in, in other fish. The good news for us is working with John Posselwaith and Ingo Brash from Oregon, the genome of the spotted gar is now available, and this, is a, this was very fortunate for us. We were able to apply this genome. 
So when we take the gar and put it in this comparison, you recall what we showed before is here is the human and the chicken shown on the baseline comparison to a mouse. You can see there's lots of similarity. Remember the take home message before was zebrafish and pufferfish don't show any similarity. When we take the gar as a unit of comparison, the story changes dramatically. Here you have the human and the chicken, but look, the gar now shows this enhancer peak conserved. And even having the gar as an intermediate taxon enabled us to pull out small peaks for both the pufferfish and the zebrafish, which were invisible to us before. Now the question is, is this chromatin accessible at the right stage of development? Are these functioning like real enhancers? For that, we used a, a, a new technique known as ATAC-seq, which shows us the accessibility of the chromatin at the right stage. We can ask the question by looking at this, is this enhancer CNS65 accessible? And you can see here those large peaks you see in whole body at 24 hours post-fertilization, they show that that chromatin is accessible, functioning likely as an enhancer. Now, when we take that enhancer region and we put it in a fish with the reporter, here's how it drives expression. It drives expression throughout the fin in 31 hours post-fertilization and then knocks out at 60 hours post-fertilization. When we take the fish element and put it in a mouse, we get the same pattern. Early in mouse limb development, it's expressed driving expression throughout the forelimb, and in late development, it it begins to knock out in the area that will form the distal part of the appendage. So the fish element in mouse is functioning just as it should for an early phase enhancer. So this is a case where having the right model organism allowed us to find an enhancer uh, present in fish that has conserved function with mouse. Now the real question we're interested in is not just these early phase telomeric enhancers. What we're interested in is those centromeric enhancers all the way on the right because these are the ones that are driving digit expression. So here we're asking the question, do fish have the genetic apparatus that drives Hox activity, which, which drives the formation of, of digits? And here's the whole Hox cluster. Just to make a long story short, there's the Hox cluster itself. These are the early phase enhancers here. On the left in, uh, in yellow are the late phase enhancers. And what I just showed you is early phase enhancers are present in fish. This is what I just showed you. And you can see uh, they report both in mouse and in gar in very similar ways. And they function as early phase enhancers. You'll notice how the expression is knocked down in the distal, in the distal fin. Now when we look at the late phase enhancers, indeed they are present uh, in fish fins when you add the gar to the comparison. They report in very similar ways in mouse and in gar. You'll see the expression activity driven by the gar element in a mouse is very similar to that driven by the mouse element in a mouse. And indeed, when we look at their expression in the fin, what they do is they drive expression across the entire fin in early development, but only in the distal fin in later development. And the same is true for other um, late phase enhancers seen in, the, uh, in mouse. They drive activity both endogenously in mouse, but the gar element also drives activity within the mouse. And you can see all the way on the left here, just like a late phase enhancer should, it drives activity throughout the fin in early development and just in a distal strip of tissue uh, in late development. What's interesting here is when we take the gar and put it in mouse and the endogenous mouth, they are very similar. Yet the zebrafish, an animal with that duplicated genome, barely even reports in the mouse genome. So this is a case to show when you have the right genetic model, right genomic model, you can see hidden similarities that would be hidden to you otherwise. The zebrafish doesn't report easily in mouse, probably because it has that duplicated genome, whereas the gar, which has the unduplicated genome, reports very much like a mouse, that behaves very much like a mouse. So just to give you a sense, looking at other Hox genes, I just want to show this for one simple point, is when you look at the endogenous activity of these, of these enhancers in a fin, what you'll notice is they drive expression in a distal strip of tissue, just like fish late phase expression of Hox genes. These same elements in mouse drive distal expression across the uh, across the mouse paddle, which becomes the digits in the wrist. So the idea here is a developmental and genomic equivalency between that distal strip of tissue you see on the right of this fish fin and the entire distal uh, paddle of a mouse limb. So this leads us to the evolutionary comparison supported by Tiktaalik, fossils like Tiktaalik, and supported by the developmental biology, is that fish indeed do have wrists. And if we take the developmental data at face value, it seems like the distal region of a fish fin, which consists of those little blobs shown uh, in yellow on the left, correspond to the wrists uh, of humans. So the take home message here is we can leverage multiple lines of data to understand evolutionary history. 
Look, I'm a paleontologist. I don't find enhancers buried in rocks. But what I have is the means to compare the enhancers of living creatures that are separated by huge phylogenetic distances. The way we do it is first start with fossils to bridge the gaps, and then devise experiments which help really bridge those gaps in a mechanistic way. So it's really an exciting time for science because we can begin to analyze evolutionary transformations using both genetic and molecular data, as well as classic paleontological data. To do an analysis like this takes amazingly talented people, including the artist who drew this lovely diagram, uh, as well as my members of my laboratory, my good colleagues uh, who have co-led the Tiktaalik expeditions with me, the Inuit community and Canadian government, which has supported our work uh, for several decades, uh, my molecular colleagues and the colleagues who have provided access uh, to the GAR genome, and of course, uh, the funders of our work. Thank you very much.